You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We are here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona, and we are definitely into the monsoonal pattern. I've had just shy of two and a half inches. Uh, Maybe it pushed up towards three. I don't know. We've had quite a bit of rain in the last few days uh, just leading up to this show, and the monsoons are here. And so I have turned off my irrigation for a bit. Now, watch that, because when this monsoonal pattern kind of ebbs and flows, it just Rains a lot for a week, and then it dries up, and so you want to monitor that. And if you need to, turn it back on. If you do turn your irrigation back on, if it's, let's say uh, you turn it off for a week, you turn it back on, I would suggest uh, cutting back or, or reducing the amount of water that you're giving your plants. And here's how you do that. You don't actually change the length of time that you're watering. You play with the frequency. How often are you watering? It's much easier to think through your irrigation that way than it is to actually go, well, I'm going to water for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to go to every other day, and you've got all these variables. It makes your brain start to smoke, and and, and it's hard to, to get it right. So for me, I figure out how long the irrigation needs to run to make my plants happy. And it's not every day for 15 minutes with a drip irrigation or micro irrigation. You, you, these systems need to run an hour, two hours, three hours to get any amount of water out of the system. So you've got to water for my, myself. I'm just shy of two hours for my trees, my shrubs, and my bigger vines. That's how long it takes to penetrate the multiple layers of, of soil to make the roots happy and deep and, and moist so that moisture stays in that soil long enough. What I play with then is Okay, this is how long I have to run my system. Now, how often do I need to make my plants happy? And so you're just playing with that one variable. Figure out how long you need to water your plants. How long? Then all you have to do is go how many days. And I use the skip days mode. Most clocks in that garage or maybe it's mounted on the outside of the by a shed or something, it's got a skip day function. I don't program water Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's too hard. And it's too difficult to play with the variable. I I go with skip days. So normally I was watering once a week, my trees and shrubs. I just turned that system off because the ground is hydrated. It's moist now in my yard. Now, if you're in areas where it's a little drier, maybe the backside of Granite Mountain, the backside of San Francisco Peaks. I noticed that the uh, uh, Sedona going up towards Flagstaff, 89A. You all get a lot of rain up there. If you get towards this, the western half of Sedona, towards Cottonwood, that area, it doesn't get quite as much. So it just depends on where you're at. Your yard, each yard, is unique and different, treated as such. And so for my yard, I've had darn close to three inches of rain. And so I turned off the irrigation. When I turn it back on, I'll probably skip days to every 10 days and monitor it. I'll wait till my butterfly bush gets kind of wilty. I'll wait till my tomatoes start to show stress. I'll wait till my roses kind of have this wilt. The leaves start to turn upside down. The grapes, the leaves will turn upside down when they get dry. You'll see the underneath side of the leaf. I'll monitor them. So you need to communicate and talk to and watch and garden. We call this gardening. But I don't want to overwater. Right now, it'd be real easy to create some root rot because you've had all this moisture, some of it is is sinking in, a lot of it just runs right off, but monitor it. And so it's a time to save some money, though, on your irrigation. You don't have to water that much. So that's what I'm doing in my yard. You know, my, my name's Ken. I'm your friend. And we're just neighbors talking over the fence. We're just leaning on, hey, here's what's working for me. And this is what's what I'm doing in my own personal gardens. We're even doing that here at the garden center. So we've got a lot of automated irrigation. Let's say all the tree racks, they're, they're automated. And so we're starting to back those off some. So it, they don't need as much. Not just the, the ground is moist, but the air is moist. The humidity has gone up. You noticed 
it's almost like a gooey factor. I feel like I'm swimming sometimes while walking, walking through the yard. And so that it does, what that does is your plants don't dry out as quickly. This is a great thing. And that'll happen through, through August, September. Sometime in September, typically the monsoons are over. But you've got, this is where it really pays to know how to program your irrigation clock. And so this is valuable. So you can really make the plants happy and save a lot of money just by learning how to program your irrigation clock. And YouTube has a lot of tutorials that you can really up your game on. So put your clocks, go to YouTube, put your clock's name or model number, and all of a sudden you'll find folks that show you how to program that, what the best ways to do that is. But for me, it's water, water deep, a long time, water, water very deep, the entire root structure, and then wait for it to dry out. That's the secret to irrigation. And then when it does rain, then don't water. Just hit the skip skip rain button. But I think it looks like we're in this wet pattern for a bit. But then it will dry out for, for a week or two, and then it will come back. So this, this moisture ebbs and flows. I did notice. Now, I would mentioned butterfly bush as a, as a kind of a canary in the coal mine. My grapes, I use that one because the, the grapes will, the leaves will get real crybaby. They'll start showing the underneath going, I'm so hot, help me, thirsty. And so I know to read that. And I go, okay, got you covered. Here's some moisture. Um, so I use that. Now, I've had some older butterfly bush that they were kind of fillers. I wanted a wall of, of junipers for some privacy, this courtyard secret garden thing I have in the front yard. Uh, but the junipers have been small. The, the garden was plugged in oh, maybe two, three years ago. Well, in the in, in between time, I put some fast growing butterfly bush. Well, now the trees, the shade trees have grown up. The maples are now shading that garden more. The junipers have filled in and they're choking out the butterfly bush and they were not blooming. They didn't look good. They were just mangy looking and they had to come out. And so I pulled out, let me think here, one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven butterfly bush out of my gardens this week. And I shot a video on that. And so if you're part of my garden club, Waters Garden Care or Garden Club, uh, you'll see that video. Take a look. Butterfly bush. If they don't look good, if they have not been blooming, you live in America. You, you should not tolerate that. For 20 bucks, you can put a new new butterfly bush in. They're very short-lived trees or bushes. And and they, one indication that they're getting old, they just aren't blooming like they used to. And so you, you can pop those things out in about, I don't know, a minute. Uh, butter, butterfly bush or budlia is a very soft wood, which is why it's such a short-lived tree. It's prone to disease. Some things happen to them. And the roots, if you don't water them correctly, they don't get a deep root structure. Or if you've got competing gardens, I've got a bunch of junipers competing for the moisture around that butterfly bush. They were suffering. And I didn't need them anymore. I pulled those things out. And oh, it cleaned up the gardens. It looks so good. In the backyard, I've got one butterfly bush. It's kind of doing the same thing. It's been kind of underperforming for a couple of years. And I've tried, I fertilize it, I prune it back. And I think I'm going to pop that one out, just replace it with another fresh butterfly bush. And now I'll get this active new growth uh, that, that pushes into lots of new, new flowers, attracts lots of butterflies. And I won't have to stress over this, this ugly plant back there. So freshness, Every year, you should add some freshness to your garden. It should ha it should look like someone's living there. It's not overgrown, uh, old, uh, like a like dark forest kind of event. Like, I dare you to walk through this garden or I'll eat your face off. Your garden should not feel that way. It should be active, fresh, alive, growing, flowering, blooming. And sometimes those junipers can get too woody, too overgrown. Your butterfly bush gets too tall, gets too woody, stops blooming. Roses get these dark, uh, the bark gets on these canes and the thorns look like you're going to rip you a new one. That's time to rip that one out, remodel and put a fresh one in. It's very easy. I'm not talking the whole landscape, but you should always add some freshness every year to your gardens. And that's what keeps them looking good, alive, active and thriving where your neighbors and friends come over, family comes over and goes, wow, 
you're such a good gardener because you're always adding a few fresh plants every year. Be right back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive. But so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Waters Weed and Grass Stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and Grass Stopper. It's just $24 and only found at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And you have tuned in to Ken and Lisa Lane, The Mountain Gardeners. We're here answering garden questions, and we just want you to be on the right cycle but sometimes you still don't even know. I've been helping customers out here at new houses. There's a lot of mm-hmm. folks, first-time home buyers, uh, quite a few of them in, helping them with their new landscape. Just helped a couple. They had nothing in their front yard or backyard. Wow. They had landscapers in putting boulders and mm-hmm. stuff. They're just trying to get educated. Sure. They've been on the website. done a lot. You could tell they've done a lot of homework. Mm-hmm. This is their first time into the garden center trying to figure it all out, basically to talk the talk so they could talk to their landscaper. I spent like 30, 40 minutes with them just getting them yeah. in tune, getting get them in the right direction. And so they bought a few fruit trees because she's a hardcore gardener. He's doing whatever <laughs> he's told. And uh, they want to start with fruit trees, which is unusual sure. for sure. brand new landscape. But she, they want fruit trees. Mm-hmm. I went, okay, hey, that's, let's start there. That's one decision down. This show is to help folks get that seasonality right, to help mm-hmm. you get pointed in that right direction. And gardening is all about seasonality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't even know the questions to ask. It helps to hear what your neighbors are asking. So that's what this segment is for. What's what have other folks been emailing, tweeting, Facebooking into us so we can just repeat those. So that's Lisa comes in to share those with us. What do we got this week? All right. Our first question is from Candace. They put in a new lawn this spring. It's been doing very well. The weeds are oh, starting to come up yeah. and take over. Now we've gotten some rain. We have weeds. What can she do to take care of the weeds but leave her new lawn alone? This is where a lot of folks make a lot of mistakes. I mean, a lot of blunders. A lot of folks think they have brown thumbs because of this exact problem. They have some weeds in their lawn. Now, first and foremost, you won't, she's got weeds now only because it's new. And so it hasn't quite thickened up. The roots haven't squeezed out all the other weeds. A very healthy lawn, you won't have weeds or very, very few weeds as long as it's healthy. Mm -hmm. So here, let me give Candace the, the formula for a super healthy lawn, and then we'll go over how to kill the weeds that she has in there. One, there's two products that you put on your lawn and you do them every other month. It's all-purpose plant food. It's a food we put together here. It's the best. It's the best lawn food ever. It's amazing. The cottonseed meal on that just may, and the bird guano makes lawns go crazy. Mm -hmm. And the other months you want to put on soil activator. Grass lawns are notorious for for thatch buildup and needing to be aerated, dethatched, and just problem. They're heavy work. So in the month of March, you start by putting all-purpose plant food on. In the month of May, you put soil activator. June, all-purpose plant food. July, soil activator. Every other month, you do that through the growing season. The growing season is March through October. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you will have the best-looking lawn you have ever had, and you will never have to aerate it or dethatch it. 
because the soil activator takes care of the thatch and encourages deeper roots. So that's why you use both in conjunction. One's a food, one's a dethatcher, get it to roots deeper. So you have a hardier plant. Now we go into, but I have weeds, Ken. <laughs> what do I do now? I would get on that program first and foremost. Get a bag of each. Probably it'll take care of most most smaller lawns. Now we're into specialized weed killers. You need a weed killer that kills broadleaves, but not the 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 grass. Right. Kills the the weeds you have, the dandelions, but not the grass. These are very high tech, high science, high touch, high. Now most folks will go out and buy a bag of turf builder with weed killer in it. That's why so many people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You can kill trees with that stuff. If you put lawn food with weed killer down underneath your cherry trees, you can kill the cherry tree. I know. I've done it. <laughs> so it's possible. You can kill off stuff you would have never intended to kill. Right. What lawn food with weed killers do is it stresses everything out to where everything wants to die, except the grass kind of comes back. Sometimes it comes back strong. Sometimes comes back weak. You never quite know. I am not an advocate. In fact, we stopped selling weed mm -hmm. lawn food with weed killers because so many people made mistakes. Part of it's the altitude. Part of it's the, the climate, the aridness. It's just a challenge. I would encourage you to fertilize. If you want to weed and feed, fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food. That'll mm -hmm. get it to start filling in, getting thicker, root deeper, and then spot treat it with a tank sprayer or trigger spray if it's just a ready to use thing either mm -hmm. one it's called weed beater ultra that's the name of the weed killer it kills wheat broadleaf weeds and lawns but not grass very selective highly effective and wipes them right out and you don't have to worry about it killing your trees or killing your lawn or overdoing it but weed beater ultra is what you'll go through with if it's a big lawn get a pump up tank sprayer if it's just a few weeds you're kind of spotting, we've got it and ready to use over the counter. You just trigger spray it in like a mini Windex bottle kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Highly effective. Weed beater ultra is what you're going to go after that with. Okay. Especially for a new lawn. They're so sensitive. Right. They yes, haven't rooted they out. They haven't quite filled in. you got to be more careful with those or you can do more damage than good. Do okay. no harm. First, do no harm. That's, that's, our, <laughs> that's our goal. First, do no harm. It's funny you mentioned the weed and feed. We had a customer in last week husband and wife she goes my husband he put that down around everything yeah, yeah. and it was just toast don't, don't, everything yeah. was toast. I, I heard that twice this week myself yeah. someone came in i hear it over and over and over again right. and people will listen in and go oh no they're just no oh, no 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 really we see it all the time <laughs> it's epidemic so yeah. stay away from lawn foods with the weed killer in it. it they are not good products they're not your friends they are not your friend okay next question is from keith he has um, a bunch of mushrooms coming yeah. up in his perennial beds and flower beds, all different varieties. Should he leave them there? Are they good? Are they bad? What do you do with them? There's no cure for, for mushrooms. What, what mushrooms are doing, they're, they're monsoon related. So the moisture went up, the humidity went up, and mushrooms are actually your friend in the garden. They help to break down or compost the organics in the garden. As the mushrooms break that down, they will then die and then compost so they become food for the plants. It's part of the life cycle, a natural cycle of gardens, especially if you're amending your lawns, your raised beds, your gardens very heavily with compost, manures, and peat moss and those organics, you're going to have mushrooms. It just happens. If they're ugly, I think they're beautiful. I keep them, I keep them in place. <laughs> in fact, I get on the kids going, don't kick those. What are you doing? They're beautiful. They're so fun to kick. <laughs> I know they are. They like to just watch them splatter. <laughs> if you really don't like them, just take a hoe to them and get them out of there. You can get ahead of it as soon as the rains stop. Mm -hmm. I would say they, they do help you compost. I did find that our Scotty <laughs> was out eating mushrooms. That's not good, <laughs> stupid dog. <laughs> He just kind of had this half buzzed look. <laughs> and then Vincent started going after it too. Because whatever the little Scotty does, the Labrador, which the puppy also does it. Mm -hmm. So I, you got to watch those. I, I tend to keep them. The ones that they tend to eat, I tend to get them out of there. I get them out of there. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. kind of watch that. They are poisonous. Do not use them in the kitchen, please. They're right. not good. Don't let your dogs eat them. I don't know why the dogs did that. Well, I think they are after the buzz. I think they're actually... You think so? I, or they're just too dumb to know any different. I, I don't know. 
I think they're feeling kind of But they of, don't harm any of, of your other plants. I mean, if they're coming no. up and oh, you no. don't mind them, they're not harming or taking no. nutrients away or they only do creating good. poisons in the ground. Yeah. No, they only do good. They do no harm. They're good for the gardens. I was, in fact, they actually sell mushroom compost. It's really? so good. They have a special compost of just mushrooms. Oh. We don't have them here at the garden center because they're so crazy expensive. I would imagine they're they're, they're high high end, way mm-hmm. high end top dressing stuff. So they're sure. they're for like New York City or something. <laughs> New <laughs> York City, <laughs> <Or> Chicago. <laughs> I don't know. Let's get a quick question in from Sandy. She has really nice tomato plants. She has lots of blossoms on her tomato plants, but she's not getting very many tomatoes. Yeah, that's what pretty do you common. think's going on? We've had the same thing with beautiful, gorgeous tomatoes. Go out and once a week, get come in and get a bottle of the Blossom set. Blossom set, that's what it's for. Go out and spritz the foliage, not the flowers. Just spritz the whole plant, get the whole thing. Once a week, just go in the morning, spritz them with Blossom set. Do that until you start to see fruits setting. And then you can cut it back to every other week. Guaranteed, if you do that, you'll have more fruit and you know what to do with. And it also increases the size of the fruits. Yeah. So it does more for you. So mm-hmm. it does does a lot of good. Blossom set. Get the big size. If they make two sizes on the shelf, don't get the little eight ounce. Get the 32 <laughs> ounce. You're spraying the whole garden with blossom set. That'll make things start to spray your peppers, squash, spray everything. That's it for this segment. You've tuned into Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Pink Volcano Phlox. Just when spring flowers are fading, these beauties revive and show off. Your grandmother only dreamed of growing a pretty pink phlox this fine. Each flower cluster could make a bridal bouquet all by itself. This new volcano series is erupting with flowers used to accent entries and fountains, all for $15. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love eruptions of pink flowers, they love to shop. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Chiffon Hibiscus. This hardy variety is one of the longest blooming, most prolific shrubs showing off massive 4-inch lavender flowers all summer long. This stately bush likes to show off and all for $39. But wait, there's more. These pretty shrubs come back again next year with even more stunning beauty. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love stunning hibiscus, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So I had some neighbors, I was out in the front yard, kind of putzing around the gardens, and some neighbors are going by going, wow, that's really pretty. Oh my goodness. That really, how do you do that? I thought I would just share in a moment, just, just how do I get things to bloom better, stronger, brighter, how to get the color out of not just the foliage, but the flowers, the, the buds. There's, there are some secrets. And here's what I've been doing this week. I started last week. I kind of finished up this week. It's, it comes down to four things. I took, took four bags of things home. And one of them is just because I found some grubs. So if you find some white worms as you're poking around, digging in the yard, I would kill grubs. Grubs are bad. They eat the roots on your plants. They attract javelina. They attract skunks into your gardens because it's a food source for them. I don't want grubs in my gardens. They're nothing but bad. No good comes of them. So it's very easy during the rainy season to throw out a grub killer. It's like fertilizer. It goes in, kills them just like that. And it's good for a long time. Like one application, you're done for the year. Uh, that, That easy. So for me, at a couple spots where I kind of struggle It's a nice, rich garden spot. And the beetles, so these summer beetles flying around, they lay their eggs. And the larva stage or the baby stage of of a beetle is a grub. So you just know when they're going to show up in the summer, and I kill them off. That's one thing. You, You may or may not need that at all. For me, I needed that. What I mainly did, I put down all purpose plant food, a 744 all purpose. It's natural, it's cottonseed meal, some bird guano, iron, sulfur. Um, so I sling that around. I do not work it in the ground. I just 
put it on top of the rock, on top of the mulch, on top of the root, root ball, and I let the rains carry it through all the rock. With that being said, if you've got an older house, let's say 10, 15 years old, back in the day, we used to actually put 10 mil black plastic underneath the rock. This is, this is early days. This is before we had weed fabrics or woven materials. A good weed fabric lets water and food through it from the surface, but it doesn't allow roots and weeds up, up from the soil that way. And so I just put that, I put the fertilizer on and I walk away. Rain will do its job. I don't even think about it. I don't even try to work it in. If, if you're a gardener, you have to go for it, but it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the food activate or do anything else. It's a granular food, slow release, organic, that every time it rains, it's going to release a little food over about a three-month period. It's like magic for grapes. Uh, uh, anything that blooms, lilacs is going to bring those buds out for your, your summer blooming, crepe myrtles, rose of Sharon's, your fruit trees, do everything, especially your evergreens, especially your Leland Cypress. They're really struggling right now with some canker issues. Fertilize them, keep them healthy, help them to keep, keep their strength up. Secondly, now for my blooming things, Russian sage, salvias, roses, anything that puts a flower on ever, but especially the summer blooming things, I am also adding at the same time a handful, I'm sprinkling on, it looks salt and peppered, some super phosphate. Super phosphate is zero, 18, zero. It's all phosphorus, no nitrogen, no potash, all, all phosphorus. Phosphorus is what, what the plant picks up in the ground at the root level to form flowers, to bring the fragrance out of the plant. So if you want fragrance, flower, fruits, you put phosphorus down, phos super phosphate. So I put that down and it just, the buds will load up. I mean, it will be noticeable. You will have the brightest Russian sage in the neighborhood. You'll have more hummingbirds on your, on your salvias or, or autumn sage than anyone else in the neighborhood because you put this phosphate on. The all-purpose food will do it, but I just find I, what it is, phosphorus is sort of like super phosphate. It's sort of like a Snickers bar. Yes, the, the all-purpose plant food is like steak and potatoes. Mm, I'm full. I feel good. Let's go grow. Let's go garden. Ugh. And then the, the super phosphate is like a Snickers bar. I just want a sweet tooth. I just want to feel good. I just want to buzz. And so you, you take down a Snickers bar or super phosphate, and the plant reacts similarly. It just grow, puts on new flowers and buds. really makes a difference. And then the last thing I'm doing especially where I've had weed issues that in between some shrubs where I'm just getting these tumbleweeds or whorehound or, or goat head, these dandelions uh, around the, the, the edge of the lawn, out near the driveway, the fence lines. And those areas I'm putting weed and grass stopper. It's a granular. Again, I'm taking advantage of the rain. I sprinkle it on there. It releases and goes into the ground and it creates a barrier where your, your weeds will not grow through that. Not only that, but the more often you use that, I use mine twice a year, weed and grasshopper, twice a year. In the winter, so January, to keep all those winter weeds, the foxtail, dandelions, some of those early winter, late winter, early spring type of weeds. And then right now I'm using it for the tumbleweed, the goat head, and dandelions are just always a problem. They're, they're like the nemesis. So there's certain there's there's heat loving weeds, and then there's winter loving weeds. And, and you use them two twice a year, and you don't have weeds. It just takes all the work out. Yeah, you got to sling it around, and it costs you twenty bucks for a bag of this stuff. But a bag covers, I think, seventy two hundred square feet. It covers a lot of real estate fast. It just takes the work out of things. Or you can do it the old fashioned way, what your grandparents did. You just hoe it around. Oh, that's just too much work for me. Anyway, that's what I'm doing. I'm putting fertilizer down, putting superphosphate, I'm putting weed and grass stopper down right now while the rains are going. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden experts and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust. 
how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive, but so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Waters Weed and Grass Stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and Grass Stopper, it's just $24 and only found at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio and inspiration. Gardening, gardens should be inspirational, don't you think? Well, of course. I mean, they should be no, fragrant. No, they should be boring. So Lisa comes and inspires us uh, every, every <laughs> week. So this segment's just all about her. In fact, my entire life is all about her. As it should be. I know, it does. I like doing that. I like providing. I like as a man providing, protecting, working with my wife. I think it's fun to... I like living with you. <laughs> I like working with you. So anyway, I love Today, you, my dear. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it does. <laughs> Tomorrow could be another story. There are stressful moments, kind of for all of us. Isn't that just life? But mm-hmm. anyway, I love it. We were on the back patio um, uh, just last night watching the sunset mm-hmm. and the hummingbirds, the bumblebees, and the, the, the butterflies were all over the mimosa. We had planted these silk tassel trees or mimosas mm-hmm. to be to look down upon from the deck it's about a story and a half up so we look down so you're looking right at the canopies you're looking almost like it's a jungle uh, the the uh, the upper green canopy and then they're all in bloom and so the pollinators are out pollinating all the flowers and it's just magical to be there sipping tea or a glass of wine and watching the sunset mm-hmm. and the wildlife that's what gardening should be that is true it was it was nice. It was very pretty. Beautiful sunset. The clouds kind of made it glow. It was mm-hmm. nice. Only thing to make it better? Yeah. Uh, rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you girl. got for us where we digress too far? <laughs> <laughs> Just go in, dive right in. So it's a it's a wonderful time of year to be planting. The monsoons That's are true. here. Uh, we have increased humidity, we have moisture, we've gotten some rain, so you can actually kind of dig in the ground again. Uh, so it's a great time to plant, and it's a great time to find things in your garden center. Uh, things are showing up. We're still getting shipments of That's true. plants. Yeah, you just unloaded two trucks yeah. yesterday. Just so, yeah. Definitely. So there's still some great perennials out there, and perennials are those plants that come back every year. Uh, and and just bloom wonderfully. So they're great additions to the yard because they're nice color, uh, comes back, blooms in your yard every year, kind of a no fuss, no muss kind of plant um, that you don't have to put a lot of labor into other than kind of deadheading, uh, feeding periodically, but you're, you're not putting a lot of work into them. So you plant it once and done. Once so other than, other than they they tend to spread or get bigger sure. or larger and mm-hmm. and so sometimes you can divide them so they get large enough like mums you could divide those after mm-hmm. they grow a few years and then mm-hmm. plant a, plant a piece of that over here and now you've got mums in two places right. instead of one right so galardias, salvias all all those things are sort of the same right so definitely great additions to the yards things you want to put in if you need some color in your yard so many of our yards are just one dimensional. We have rock yeah, and something true. green out there. <laughs> most most yards, at least in the mountains, there is, is, at least in the Prescott, Prescott Valley, I would go so far as Cottonwood, Sedona, they're boring. Mm-hmm. They're rocked over and they're low maintenance, low water, but mainly we want to travel, not be, we want to, you can have both. You can have oh, low sure. care, low water and mm-hmm. beauty, but in this type of landscape, you have to be more deliberate. You have mm-hmm. to be more of a style, uh, whereas other places like the Midwest, you just yeah, you get it close, and everything else is going to be lawn. So there's so much green, you kind of go, ah, it's good enough. I feel like I'm in Ireland. There we go. <laughs> so here you have to be more deliberate yeah. with the design. Yeah, a little bit of color goes a long way. Like and an oasis. Yeah, you yeah. can spruce things up. My goodness, put some color in your yard, people. 
Get some, put some color in your life. <laughs> so some of the ones that we got in that uh, just looked really nice this week, Little Bang Red Elf Coreopsis. Now, most wow. people are used to the Coreopsis. It's yellow. Yeah. It's yellow. It's a variation. It could be a double yellow. Yeah. <laughs> it could be single yellow, but it's yellow. Uh, the Red Elf is really pretty because it is definitely a red Coreopsis. Yeah, that's super unusual. That's one that's so unusual, you're only going to find it. At Waters Garden Center. <laughs> I mean, you could almost go that far. That is super sure. unusual. Oranges and yellows are yeah. kind of what you get with Coreopsis, but mm-hmm. not red. Yeah. That's exciting. Same hardiness. Right. Same sunlight. Same mm-hmm. full, full oh, sun. Oh, loves the sun. Yeah. Uh, but very pretty. Just that nice red color. Definitely. Got to come look at that. And they've come out with a new hardy lantana. Now, oh. most people are used to the Miss Huff lantana, which is the only, has been the only really truly hardy one for here zone seven um and that was kind of an orangey orangey pink one yeah so now they've come out with a new one called mary ann mary ann lantana so this one is more of a yellow a softer yellow pink one so they're again zone seven to eleven so once going to want a warmer spot in your yard with some radiant heat uh, but it should be very, very pretty, kind of a softer color. Yeah, boy, Lantana, the, the folks in Phoenix would would really like that. Tucson, Palm mm-hmm. Springs, they like their Lantanas. They grow right. well. They bloom in the summer Oh yeah, a long time, and they're a great pollinator. Mm-hmm. So we've got a Lantana in our front yard. The birds are nesting in right now. It's, it's, yeah. it's wonderful. So Mary Ann, Mary Ann Lantana. Yeah. I just got my brain went to Gilligan's Island. I Wasn't know. one of the characters Mary Ann? Mary Ann. She was Does the, the dark haired, cute one. Ginger was the the sex goddess one. Not in my world. Mine was Mary Ann. Oh, come on. You were a teenage boy. Mar- yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> In Don't the try 70s. To pull that one on me, honey. <laughs> okay. I know better. <laughs> well, let's go to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, most people are familiar with the red hot poker. They're uh, the traditional one, the larger one with the red kind of orangey look to it. There's also some dwarf ones that don't get quite as tall. Uh, so, if you have a smaller yard, maybe you want to go with the dwarf. There's a mango popsicle. Ooh, that sounds is, fun. Wow. Is, uh, more orangey colored. And then there's a lemon popsicle, more of a yellow colored one. Mm-hmm. So if you have a smaller space, a uh, smaller perennial yard, those would be great ones to put into. So most of your, your red hot pokers, I'll get about hip high or so mm-hmm. with the bloom. And they're orangey yeah. so in, in color. And then they're great in that javelina, deer, rabbits. Nothing eats those, right. which is great. And the dwarf one's going to be about 18, knee high. Yeah, 18 yeah. to 24 inches. So half the height. And then you get some more color options. Right. So you could you could have fun with that. And when they're done blooming, you prune off that bloom and then it just looks like a beautiful grass or like a mm-hmm. like a really thick yucca. Very draw plant. hardy. Very super draw hardy. Yeah, and the birds love them. Yeah. So Ekabe Ek Epa Maybe. Ekabekia. Oh, that's a hard one to say. That's, <laughs> they're gonna say Echinacea. Yeah. Epa what is it again? Eka now I can't say Echabechia. Okay. It is a cross between a rud- Rudabechia and Echinacea. Oh, no wonder. Echa. That makes sense. So I think those came out a couple of years ago. So it's still a relatively new plant. Um, looks like a, it has a daisy look to it, but it has a darker color. So really pretty uh, kind of bronzy colors, yeah. yellows, but it has a daisy look to it. Very attractive. So that gets up again about like Rubecchia, Echinacea. Yeah, 18, they get up about knee high, inches. just a little bit shorter. Mm-hmm. And then I missed that one. I have to take a look after the show. I'm going to run out there and take a look. We have I some really, that. really pretty ones. Yeah. Really dark yellow. How big is that bronze. flower? Is that like That's probably silver dollar, bigger than that? Bigger than a silver. Yeah, probably oh. four inches across, oh, four well, to five good. inches. Yeah. Very pretty. And then, of course, echinaceas, which most people are familiar with the purple one, but they have some great new colors. They have a double scoop bubblegum one, which is pink. Look, the names coming out with these. This is great. They have a salsa one, which is kind of orange, uh, Cheyenne Spirit, which is yellow to orange. Uh, And those are just terrific wildflowers, very animal resistant um, great wildflower feeder at the end of the season. And Definitely they reseed. Ours, ours has come back. It that spreads throughout the yard. Different places. So it's a bird. We're bird gardeners. Mm-hmm. So we like to attract the wildlife. And right. it 
definitely does that. So echinaceas are should be on the list. Should mm-hmm. you should have one echinacea in every yard. It's just I that agree. easy to grow. And we have some Monarda in, which uh, Monarda bee bop, which is um, bee balm. Okay. Uh, which has a really cool flower to it. These are about to pop into bloom. Uh, you got to check out their blossom because it's just very unique. It almost looks like a little like fireworks blossom. Oh, on nice. It. Really yeah. cool looking. Like landing pads for pollinators because mm-hmm. bee balm is definitely a pollinator plant. So oh, yeah. uh, monarchs and sw- swallowtails and bumblebees and hummingbirds, they're all going to love those, those pollinating kind of plants. Big summer. And those will bloom from now through the end of autumn. Mm-hmm. So you get a long bloom cycle on each one of these that you've mentioned. So now's a good time to be putting perennials in your yard. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Prosythia already flowered? Hylacs languishing in the heat? Spring bloomers already pooped? Butterfly bushes are going strong and rebloom all summer long. Pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds love butterfly bush for their fantastic fragrance and bright summer colors. These tough head high beauties love summer sun and bloom nonstop. Fresh new plants just arrived at the place where people who love butterflies and butterfly bushes, they love to shop. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Kim here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Shades Blooming Penta. One of the best butterfly attracting plants. It's right up there with milkweed, only prettier. Hummingbirds have to dance around all the butterflies of this deeply colored summer bloomer. Plant a few in the vegetable garden to attract pollinators that help tomatoes and squash set more fruit, all for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Sometimes, have you ever noticed, you go out and you plant those nice pansies, petunias, geraniums. You go back out a week later, and they've been eaten. That just bothers me. That's just not even right. Well, mammals, how do we, how do we garden with the wildlife out there? And there are some new repellents out that are really, really good. But how do you use them? There's different granulars, there's liquids, there's concentrates, or just, it can be, I've got a wall of repellents of different types. One seems to always shine to the top. It's number one seller by far. It's put, it's called Repels All by Bonide. And it has the broadest range of different critters from rabbits to birds to skunks and raccoons to rats and squirrels. It just has a deer. It's got a broad mix and yet it's organic which is great. So you can spray it up there in the yard and not have to worry about poisoning the dogs and, and you don't have to worry about harming the animals, just keeping them away. When do you use what variety and how and when? It can be timing. Gardening is all about timing. Well, I've got the expert in the studio. John Ford, his company, Bonide, put together, I think, the best repellent that's on the market, uh, That that's at least the broadest mix For the mountains of Arizona, it really seems to work better than others, and I've sold a boatload of them. And there's several out there on the shelf. I I think their repels all is bar none the best, but even in my mind, I get confused. When do I use a granular? When do I use a liquid? When do I coat the foliage? When do I just put on the ground? And if we get time, maybe we'll even go into snake repellents, that kind of stuff. John, welcome to the studio. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. So repellents, how do we, it's, we're into the growing season. Which one should I be using? Why don't we start with how do you even develop a product like this? It's got blood meal and garlic and putrefied egg solids. Well, <laughs> Where do you well let's, these let's, start, let's start with that one. <laughs> putrefied egg solids is why you can't apply Repelzol to edibles because that oh. may be salmonella. Okay. So, you know, again, an all natural product sometimes isn't good for consumption. So um, now you're saying I might be spreading salmonella, and that doesn't sound so good out in the yard. Now, I've never seen that or had a problem, or but I wouldn't put it on my edibles anyway. I don't want my tomatoes tasting like 
Th- that's repellent. what the EPA looks at. Oh, okay. That, that's not gotcha. what you have to look at. Got it. Um, but when you take a, a, a host of active ingredients and you put it into one product, we were laid into the marketplace and we realized that we had to be competitive in, in capsations and egg solids and meat meal. And all of these products are used regionally for different animals. Mm-hmm. Why not put them all into one product? and label it as repels all and and what we found out was is that it became remarkable in its use in its results and in its turn for dollars uh, ken we've sold millions of dollars of this product nationally yeah, it's just it might a wonderful be at my store i don't know it's it's we go through a lot of repels all but we were in this interface where we have a lot of forest northern arizona is basically forest land and then we've got a house there and so we get this interaction with the wildlife back and forth it can be a struggle and so if you're planting if you have a bunch of wildlife if you have not fenced them out just plant it spray it with round with repels all and and you'll find you'll have better luck so you got to train them that you're what you just planted is nasty tasting don't even start that's right if you approached a, a squirrel or a rabbit on your lawn what he does is he runs away they're very aware of their environment i mean some of them get cocky eventually and they kind of uh, <laughs> taunt you at a distance while they're holding your yeah. your fruit in their hands <laughs> um but uh, they they are very well aware of you being there and and what these repellents do is they they enhance that fear factor or that that quality that they have in their environment there's something wrong and it's better to move into an area that they feel more comfortable about and when you use any repellent and and certainly I hope with my products that you treat the areas that they're bothersome most and what you'll notice after treatment is that they've moved into adjacent areas they're still there but they're no longer foraging on the area that's treated. So I'd say to answer your question that we started the conversation on, repellents and dry forms work earlier in the season because there's plenty of forageable material out there. There's plenty of weeds, there's plenty of green, there's a lot of stuff to eat. And the the dry forms work on the smell and on the tactiles. They don't want it on their feet, they don't want it in their nostrils. They just don't want to be around it. And then toward the end of the season where most of it's all shriveled up and we're back into that high desert uh, phenomena we call Prescott, um, then they're so hungry that they'll walk over the the, the, the irritants mm-hmm. to get to the plant material. And I think it's more effective to have the sprays where the final taste portion of these repellents kick so in. new foliage coming up on that rose, the rosebuds, <laughs> spray that. That's correct. Then they'll come in and nibble it and go, whoa, this is just not even right. I think I'll keep grazing on. Right. Eventually, they end up in your neighbor's yard. And and as long as you know that they must be reapplied, they're not magic. And and what we're doing is it's more of a training tool. It's uh, we're we're not harming them by any stretch of the means. We're just moving them. So we're training them early on with the granular. So you basically have taken, I don't know, something like vermiculite. You've dipped it in this repels all to where they pick it up on their hooves, on their paws. They preen themselves and get it on their face. They kind of go, what just happened? I thought I was happy, and now I'm not. Every time I come over here, the same thing happens. Or I get it up my nostrils. As we progress and things start to leaf out, they start to become more mature, then we should start to switch and spray the foliage with the liquid variety of Repelzol. Right. Uh, you know, alternating the products occasionally is sometimes to mix it up so that they're what you're doing is trying to create an environment that that really forces them to forage somewhere else. I call that the shock and awe method. So just hit them with everything, both <laughs> barrels. And that does that seem to work. I've had some luck with javelina and the granular variety where they're rooting around. They'll get that in their nostrils and it drives them crazy. They don't like it. Now, if there's a herd of of deer or javelina sitting there and you're trying to get them to rebed somewhere else. If they're right in the middle of your yard and this is where they call home, it's hard to get them off of there. That, that's a challenge there. We might move to electric fence or some sort of fic- fencing mechanisms, or you can throw the bottle at them after you're done going, get out of here. Get out. Get, well, leave. In, in, in very small print on the label is our, is our uh, shotgun trademark. And, and perhaps sometimes that'll oh. work as well. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, so now I've got uh, 
So I want to get to Snake Stopper, but any last thoughts on the, the repels all? It's important that when you apply the granule that you activate it with a little water prior oh. to a rainstorm is actually oh, recommended really? on the label. I would think you'd right. want to keep it dry. So no, that's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. So it goes into the ground, actually affects the ground. It's not the granules. That's that's valuable. You know, when after the rainstorm, you can smell the desert. After yep. the rainstorm, you can smell the repellent. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Right. Now, snakes. There's a couple migratory patterns that we get into where we see a lot of snakes. I mean, they just come through the rattlesnakes, come out in the spring and the fall as they're leaving their nest or going back to their nest, and, and they can get into the gardens. So and some people freak out. I kind of look at snakes and go, if they're small and not rattling at me, they're a friend because they eat grasshoppers and mice. And if they're big and scary and rattling, I, I don't like them as much. So I try to get them away, go, and go somewhere else. You've come up with a snake preventer I mean, just keeps them away i, I truly feel like a, a a peddler and that's my wagon out front and the monkey sitting on it playing in the accordion <laughs> holding, holding a snake <laughs> but uh, in in today's marketplace we actually have a usda approved snake repellent it's a combination of natural based oils and uh, with testing they've determined that a snake's ability to pull in their entire environment over their tongue into or past a Jacobson's organ in their mouth. They don't smell. Everything that they do is associated with their tongue. Heat, prey, um, fear, it's all its all associated with that Jacobson's um, organ. So with the application bands of snake, uh, snake stopper, what it does is that the snake will approach the band and turn right or left. He will not cross the band. So if you um, if you treat, for example, a wood pile in the early evening uh, when they're leaving to go and hunt for food, then they can't come back to the wood pile. Uh, another way to look at it is, is that if you took it camping and you put it around your campsite and there's a snake in the campsite, it's not going to want to leave either. Yeah, okay. So you, you want to treat areas that you know that the snakes are remove from if you're trying to prevent him from gotcha. getting into it that's good so if if you have a raised house for example early evening they go out and forage and then you would treat around the house and then they don't come back valuable info that's i hadn't thought about using it for camping as well that's that's brilliant so yeah snake stopper does actually work so you've tuned into the mountain gardener we'll be right back The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our timeless beauty, Desert Willow. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unusual water selection is prized for its long bloom time without setting the usual seed pods. The flowers are highly attractive to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native, and just $49. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to bloom, they love to shop. Ouch! Oh man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. We got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now, we just had some of the nicest perennials of the season show up and deliver at the garden center just this week. They're stunning. Echinaceas, gallardias. Uh, uh, Coreopsis, different varieties of summer bloomers. They're just over the top, huge heads, hundreds of flowers. They're amazing. It is a good idea to plant now. 
So I just talked to the planting crews. I'm going, hey, Jared, hey, hey, uh, Will, how, how is the soil? They're going, it is so much better, so much easier to dig in the soil right now. We haven't even broken out the jackhammer this week. So there's, we've got two planting trucks, two crews, and they always have digging bars, pry bars, uh, uh, concrete bars, and jackhammers. And the soil is finally hydrated enough where you can dig in the soil much, much easier. So if you're going to plant yourself, I mean, obviously, if you're going to have us do it for you, plant anytime you want. Just keep keep up with the watering. Right now, though, it's a great time to plant trees, especially bigger trees, junipers, uh, you, you, your uh, uh, spruce, pine, firs, uh, Douglas firs. We, the Douglas firs have, have pushed out new growth. They are stunning. And so it's a good time because the soil is warm and moist. And we get this afternoon breeze. Just make sure if you're planting a tree to stake it. And these storms have had several customers where trees are blowing over. I mean, the storm systems are have such ferocious wind, they're snapping off or they're, they're twisting or they're breaking or they're laying down. Make sure you put a lodge pole on either side. Tie once. You want the tree to be able to move back and forth, but not fall over. So that's the secret. And then if you're thinking summer perennials, oh, the best selection is now. Here's the thing to watch, though. Your garden centers, many of them, especially the smaller smaller garden centers, I really, I've seen this in the box stores. I mean, no offense, box stores, but come on. Throw away some bad stuff. They got heat stressed, and they look withered and wilted and yellow and thin, and they just aren't fresh. Be careful. Watch what you're buying. Make sure you're buying freshness with plants. You want a fresh, new, vibrant, actively growing plant, not a leftover, stressed out, root bound plant. And this is when some of the, the plants get stressed. You'll go into the nursery and buy something in the summer, and it should have been sold, you know, four or five, six months ago, but they still have it. And now they got a special price. Come on down, buy, buy my junk, plant it, it'll grow. Well, it may not grow. It might actually suffer, be stressed, and never come out of it. And so you really want to look for fresh, and you can tell. You can tell. The foliage is off-colored. It's wilted. It's ragged. It's torn. Sometimes you see obvious bugs. I mean, I was in one place, had aphids all over. their pine trees. I'm going, whoa, man, I just want to leave. Tuck, tuck my head in embarrassment and just walk away. So just make sure freshness is good. And your bigger garden centers, they are still harvesting. They're still bringing in plants. We had three trucks come in this week. So that's freshness. You want freshness. And it's okay to plant because of the, because of the uh, humidity, the humidity, the, the moisture, the rains. It's like another planting season. If you're going to overseed new lawn, now is the time. The, the rains really, really help you out. So we've got a whole series of garden classes uh, that are free. So this week, it's container gardens. Every week, at 9.30. Next week, the 28th, is perennial flowers. We're showing off and stocking up perennial flowers. Then uh, Cheryl is going to teach our, our rose managers, going to go easy grow roses. Here's the best ones. And then it's herbs. Those are all available online at watersgardencenter.com or Facebook forward slash Waters Garden Center. We're pretty easy to find. Just type in Waters Garden Center classes, and they'll pop up. But uh, they're free, they're every Saturday, and they're made to help you be a better gardener in local landscapes. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I hate weeds. Monsoon rains are so refreshing, even my landscape comes alive, but so do my weeds. Stop weeds in their track in one simple step. Water's weed and grass stopper spreads like fertilizer. It kills weed seed before monsoon rains allow them to sprout. No need to weed. It's safe for trees, even flower beds, and so much safer than that toxic waste the big box sells. Weed and grass stopper, it's just $24 and only found at Water's Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. 
Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.